let's face it, Matt has, uh, I think, uh, achieved amazing uh, progress in the last year. So uh, you presented last year in Istanbul, and we're going to see some uh, an update, and you've got a whole host of demos running as well. So, <laughs> Or not running at the moment, but don't worry. You know, this guy can sort of program, recompile a number of times while presenting and get a drone to basically uh, function over WebRTC. So complete confidence in that uh, they may not be working at the moment, but they will be by the end of your presentation. Thank you, Alan. Is this thing on? Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, there may be some dangerous demos. Um, of, uh, not quite as dangerous, I'm, I'm sure, as what is to follow, but still pretty dangerous in that they weren't working 10 minutes ago. So it's going to be a miracle if it works. So everybody pray for miracle, and uh, let me talk to you about Matrix. All right. Am I, am I being projected somewhere? Yes. Wonderful. So yeah, as Alan says, um, I first spoke to him actually, as one of the first people to validate the idea of Matrix about a year and a half ago, um, mainly as an exercise to get funded to go off on this crazy mission um, to build a completely open source interoperable ecosystem um, for communication. So what is Matrix? Really, our mission is to make VoIP, IP messaging, and IoT as ubiquitous as email. The problem that we're all familiar with, I'm sure, is that you have all of these wall gardens which do not interoperate. All of your communication is fragmented uh, uh, between them. If you have Bob wanting to talk to Alice, who knows which app to use? Who knows which identity system to use? All of your conversations, all of your contacts are split across all of these different wall gardens, these silos. And users are basically locked into these proprietary communication apps. They have no control over who they trust with their data or their privacy. The conversations and the contacts are completely fragmented. Our thesis is that people should communicate with the apps and services they choose and that they trust. I should not be forced to use Skype because James wants me to use Skype. I should not be forced to use Hangouts because Alan wants to use Hangouts. I really should have that choice. I should not be forced into making these decisions based on my random contacts. So this is really what Matrix is trying to solve. And we are just over a year old. We launched them um, back in TechCrunch Disrupt in San Francisco last year. And it's been an epic year <laughs> in terms of trying to pull this all together. But I'm happy to say that things have been looking fairly promising. Uh, before I go into the kind of update of where things are at, um, just recapping a bit more. The, the main use cases for Matrix are group communication. So that's group chat. Um, everything is group. You can have a one-to-one -one conversation with somebody, but that's just a room that happens to have two people in it. We find this is incredibly useful, not special casing the idea of a one-to-one -one conversation, which is, let's face it, a carryover from the, the old school of circuit-switched one-to-one -one phone calls. Just imagine if every one-to-one -one chat you ever had, you could suddenly halfway through decide, hey, I want to pull in my PA, I want to pull in a secretary, I want to pull in somebody else, I want to disclose this to a wider audience. This is kind of baked into Matrix. You can use it for WebRTC signaling. Um, it's very pragmatic, HTTP APIs. We're not talking SIP or XMPP here. We're just using the good old HTTP APIs that everybody is now familiar with, but standardizing them in an open, interoperable manner. And this is really useful for WebRTC, which otherwise basically lacks a standard HTTP signaling plane. It's great for bridging together communication silos and defragmenting, as per the earlier slides. And you can also use it as a messaging fabric for Internet of Things data. So if you have a widget from one vendor that needs to publish some, da some data that is subscribed by a different service or a different widget from a different vendor, Matrix is literally the matrix which is going and linking these things together. So if you're familiar with Firebase or PubNub or Pusher or one of these um, closed software as a service PubSub services, Matrix, again, is very similar to this, except it's completely decentralized and completely open source. So anybody in the room can spin up their own Matrix server and go and start publishing and communicating um, data to one another. So what do you actually get with Matrix? Is this thing on? Can I back away from this? Is there a way to make it work? Or? Hello. Am I on here? I am. Wonderful. So now I can wander over here. 
sorry for making work for you guys. Um, so the matrix ecosystem, as it stands today, is basically split um, like this. Our main deliverable is the specification, which is, oh, okay, I'll use the bigger screen. So you use the specification, which is HTTP um, APIs, and defines how different clients can go and talk to different servers. And we provide an open source reference server called Synapse. We provide lots of bridges and application services to other things, other silos, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and there's also lots of third party servers and services which people have built too. On the client side, you get a web stack built on JavaScript, an iOS stack, an Android one from the matrix.org team, and you also have other clients from the wider community. Um, this, in turn, on the client side is split into a simple library that wraps the HTTP API and then reusable user interface components. So if you want to add WebRTC or chat functions to an existing app, you can just pick up these open source components and drop them into your existing app, or you can take one of our existing apps, like the web console or iOS or Android consoles, and customize them as you desire. This one here is Vector, which is an example glossy application that has been written um, on top of the React um, SDK. Does that make sense? Any questions at this point? Perfect. I shall continue. So the architecture for this, which I apologize that many will have seen it before, is a mesh of servers here, which all go and talk to one another. The really cool thing is that the conversation history is distributed across these servers. There is no single server that owns the conversation. There is no vendor, no network who has control over that conversation. So if this is, I know, the matrix.org server, and this is a Ericsson one, and this is a Metaswitch one, we can be communicating with people here, the clients, connected to the respective servers, and that room is totally decentralized across the different um, uh, parties. It's like email. I mean, it's, uh, it's just removing the central focus that you typically get in today's siloed um, communities. So where are we at? As I said earlier, we really started off in about well, a year and a half ago, and the questions we were looking at were, why hasn't this happened before? Why did SIP fail for Open Federation? Why has XMPP and Jabber failed for Open Federation? Why isn't there an HTTP API for WebRTC? As in, why, why are we messing around putting SIP over WebSockets and these weird contortions rather than just having a standard HTTP API to set up WebRTC calls? Where is the alt open alternative to all of these um, closed proprietary pub sub services? A really interesting question for many people here is what actually is the answer for telcos to successfully provide OTT comm services? How do you avoid being the dumb pipe? How can you still retain relevance if you're a telco in terms of providing communication services that compete with these closed silos you see on the net? And finally, the conclusion was really, let's, let's just go and build it. Let's go and create this pragmatic new ecosystem and see who uses it. So since then, um, it's really been a year of, well, 2014 was the year of the alpha. Um, we launched in September, and it was a very, very basic proof of concept. But come December, we actually launched beta, and we've spent the entirety of 2015 iterating on the beta going and fixing problems with the spec and the implementations and adding in all of the more interesting missing features. Um, we got to a stable beta mid-year, and as of November, we're really polishing the final missing features and are hopefully going to finally, finally exit beta towards the end of the year, shall we say Christmas. So where are we at right now? On the client apps and SDK side of things, so this is native matrix functionality where people are actually building directly on the matrix APIs. Uh, we've got 18 clients out there in the world that we know about. Um, three of those have been written by the core team. And these are all over the place. And let's get with the dangerous demos. Oh, this is still on. This is very exciting. Um, and i um, trying to show you as many clients as I can in very limited time. So let me just drop out of horrible PowerPoint. So the first one we have here is text UIs, so WeChat and Emacs. This is like the geekiest possible thing we can possibly imagine. If I, if I quickly zoom in, can you all read that? 
And uh, everybody ignore all of the desktop notifications coming up there. I'm going to shell into my home computer. This is the simplest, ugliest comedy matrix client imaginable. It's actually incredibly usable. You can see how quickly you can switch between um, different screens and different conversations. I've got about 600 conversations going on here. This was written by a guy called Torg Theme in Norway as a random um, side project. But it's very popular amongst all the geeks. So that's um, at one extreme. Another extreme is the glossy side of things. So let me zoom in on this. Th this app here is called Vector, and it's an example of a really glossy um, web-based matrix client. If you're familiar with Slack or HipChat or things like that, you'll see this is really quite a um, uh, similar look and feel. It's precisely the same room that we were looking at before. And you can see we've got images um, in here. We've got um, 1,700 people in this room from all over the place. Um, some of them are running their own servers, like this guy, Brabo on uh, .quickly.undo.it great domain name, um, is running his own matrix server, and then lots of other people um, in here on matrix.org. So in fact, some of the people in this room run their own matrix servers. So thank you, um, Sebastian and Andy and others who uh, run their own uh, ones, and indeed James on the true phone side of things. So uh, what can we do here? This is all looking like group chat. Lots and lots of different rooms here. You can see we can quickly switch between them. Uh, this is all live, by the way, on vector.im slash beta. You can see I've got about 700 different rooms going on here. Some of the new features um, are the ability to favorite your rooms. And, and I can drop and drag. Say I'm going to put vector up at the top priority there. This is actually being synchronized in real time using Matrix across all of my other vector clients. So if I go and quickly pull up a different window like this one, you can see that, sure enough, Vector is now at the top here. Um, this has collapsed to sh save space into a vertical column. But if I go and drag Vector back down there, you should be able to see, yay, it's all synchronizing in real time across this. This isn't an app-specific thing. It's using room tagging as a relatively new feature of Matrix. Now, this is all well from a chat perspective. What if I try to go and do, oh, hello, James. Um, what if I go and try to actually do a video call this isn't so exciting, but um, let me find. Here's one of my test users. Hello. Oh, there we go. So I'm getting a, a desktop notification uh, to yet another window where I've got the other side of this conversation. If I hit the video call button, then I'm just doing a WebRTC call from, a, uh, from one to the other. And sure enough, I know everybody. It, it's just a quick WebRTC setup, except it's doing it over HTTP. So one hit to do an offer, one hit for a request, and that's it. No SIP, no XMPP, no jingle. It's very, very um, simple and really quite a pleasure to work with, even if I say so myself. Um, more fun thing that we haven't shown that much is the conferencing that we have built in um, nowadays. So if I go to... Uh, not Slack, that's a different demo. Here we go. If we go back to um, this one here, and this is our internal room. You can see a whole bunch of developers arguing about stack traces. Um, I'm going to try to demo the VC. Um, anybody can hit the video call button in any room and suddenly turn it into a video conference. This is using FreeSwitch as the conferencing fabric, and hopefully the connectivity hello, is good enough that you then get a multi-way call like this coming up. Now, predictably enough, one of the guys who's joined hasn't got a webcam plugged in, but I'm hoping somebody else on the team is going to be um, smart enough to join with a webcam um, enabled, hopefully. If not, then perhaps. Actually, I'm doing this in our internal room. Otherwise, I'd invite uh, everybody else to go and jump and join in. You see, I told you the same demo was going to be dangerous. Let's give it a, another minute just in case somebody does manage to dial in. Otherwise, you can just see my beautiful um, echo. Oh, hello, Dan. That's impressive. Hello, Dan. Oh, and hello, Dave. Are you, are you in New York, Dan? Can you even hear me? I bet he's not got the volume turned up. Anyway, basically, look, spontaneous freeway conference between Dave in London, Dan in New York, and me here. Thanks, Dave. Um, let me get out of here. <laughs> So uh, an interesting thing here is that you've got a lot at the top the ping ongoing conference call. So literally anybody in that room just has a single bar, click on that, and get dumped into the conference. 
I would say this is a little bit better than the Hangouts environment of, oh dear, have you got the right email address? Or no, sorry, that's not my Google account and all that kind of mess. Uh, what else can I show you? So we've done back to console on iOS. Probably don't have time, but we have um, mobile versions of all of these too, as I said earlier. On the SDK side, we provide, and let me recover my mic here if I can. So on the SDK side, we've got the official JavaScript, React, Angular, iOS, and Android. We also have semi-official Python and Perl ones, and the community has gone and contributed all kinds of weird languages, ranging from Common Lisp to Ruby to Erlang, and there's even an Emacs SDK for people who really like Emacs. Um, let me... React SDK is what Vector that you just saw is written on. This is really cool because you get lots of different abstractions here. On top of the browser, you get the JavaScript SDK and then React from Facebook. Then you have the SDK on top of that, but then you actually have the separated brandable skin and controllers and the application layer um, sitting on top here. So if you were doing a fancy, glossy web application, you got all of the building blocks. Home server-wise, we provide the Python twisted Synapse one, but um, the nice people at Ericsson Research have recently released a Go implementation that is, uh, it's experimental, it's not feature complete, but it's a good starting point for messing around with the Go language. There's another third-party contribution from uh, uh, called Pallium, also in Go. There's JSynapse, and then there is Codename Dendron, which is our next generation scalable implementation, uh, which will either replace Synapse or at least um, be a kind of more performant version of Synapse. Community-wise, and let me actually start presenting so we get rid of all the notifications. Community-wise, um, things are really looking quite good. You can see that things really took off in July when we started turning on our bridges. Right now, just looking at the matrix.org node, we've got 80,000 um, users on that. We're seeing about 100,000 messages a day. That's spread, well, it's not spread, it is one of 250 servers which are actively federating together. And in terms of the companies building on it, there are about 20 that we know about who have admitted to actually running their servers and experimenting on top here. So that's basically what's happening on the spec and the client side. How am I doing for time, Alan? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Brilliant. I've got about 40 slides in two minutes. This is going to be amazing. So bridges and integrations is where a lot of work has gone recently. If you've got Matrix and you've got an existing app like uh, SIP Gateway or Slack or the PSTN, then we provide these application service API to bridge the two together. So if you have an existing app and you want to link it into Matrix, this is how you do it. Um, Stack-wise is that you've got Node typically, but you can use any language. But if you want to use our existing libraries, you have to use Node. JavaScript, an app server API, and then a bridge API. And then you've got IRC and Slack and Purple and all sorts on top. So for instance, on IRC, it looks like that, if you know what IRC is. Um, for Slack, it looks like, again, the same thing, but with a Slack bridge. For SMS, again, you could do it with an SMS gateway as we have. Um, and we've even now built bridges to Skype, Link, Facebook, even AIM and ICQ if you're stuck in the 90s. More recently, we've also linked an asterisk using Chandra Spoke. And there's a nice sequence diagram that I don't have time to talk you through. And finally, on the IoT side of things, um, there's a demo that um, Dennis will remember because the drone crashed into his head where we've controlled um, uh, the drone via matrix. The end goal, basically, is to go and take all of these islands and link them together in the middle with the decentralized glue of matrix. And I guess I'm pretty much out of time. Two more slides very quickly. Okay. New stuff, spec stuff, end-to-end -end encryption is almost with us. Search is with us. Read receipts are really, really cool and are with us. Um, you just saw conferencing, screen sharing exists too, and the ability to attach private user data to rooms. What's left? Actually deploying end-to-end, -end, threading, tagging, group ACLs, arbitrary messaging for arbitrary data, file tagging, decentralized identity, and fixing spam. We need help. Please follow us on Twitter, run a server, give us feedback. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. It certainly has been an intense ride over the past year. Time for just one question. Any question from the audience? If not, I'll pass just one comment. Oh, Second. there you go. Just hang a sec so everybody can hear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so the last point was uh, fixing spam. Yeah. So I, I would like to know how can you fight spam on the network if it's decentralized, and mm -hmm. how can you um, 
let's say, kick out uh, bad notes, people so that didn't implement the things properly or is just uh, trying to do something to abuse it? Okay, that is a huge but very, very important question. Obviously, we're familiar with both email and the PSTN as being pretty much open federation and you get a lot of spam. We have to fix that matrix, otherwise all we've done is to create a really easy HTTP API that can plug into everything that allows everybody to spam trivially on any platform imaginable, and that would be a disaster. Fixing it is hard. We're looking at many different approaches, but the most popular one right now is a blockchain style approach where we go and have a cryptographic decentralized ledger parallel to Matrix, but not actually using Matrix that tracks the reputation of both the people, the servers, the services, and the identity providers. Basically, can't trust anybody and tries to reconcile that into a score of whether basically when Joe Kim sends me an invite on Matrix, what is your eBay rating style reputation that gives me some confidence that you are who you say you are? But doing it in, yeah, basically doing it in such a way that everybody keeps each other honest. And it's really hard. It's much harder than the rest of Matrix put together. But we have um, people working on it, the best men working on it. Because it's an open source project that enables that. Oh, yeah. And actually, some people have joined us. Uh, uh, one of the Googlers who have joined us recently came because of the fun slide of fixing spam, having basically done it within Google. Wouldn't it be more fun to do it uh, across the whole world? Cool. That's excellent. So again, a round of applause for excellent presentation. Thank you. So Pedro, uh, if you can come on down and get set up. So while Pedro is getting set up, just uh, one comment. Uh, Matrix has been a supporter of TADHAC uh, through uh, this year. And one of the common themes, I, 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 it sounds very interesting. You can see the games. The, you know, well, the opportunities it creates, but with the hackers, what they've been able to do, it's just been amazing. From, of course, drone control, robot control, through to communications. So it's just the flexibility, the openness, the ease with which hackers have been able to take Matrix and then plug it into a whole range of scenarios so easily, I think has been uh, very insightful. Uh, and really enabled Matrix to show its potential across a very broad developer community. So well done in all the work that you've done through TATAC. Thanks so much, Matt.